News of the Times, Frightful Fridays, Murderous Stories from Suffolk. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we are following up on a request for murderous stories from Suffolk. Our first story takes place in the village of Thrandeston in 1851. Pretty Mary Baker is openly stabbed at a fair on the village green. The culprit is her employer, John Mickleberg, who seems upset to see her enjoying herself with her sweetheart. Our second story from 1920 is the highly disturbing case of 13-year-old Edith Elizabeth Howes, whose body was discovered in a pond from her hand sticking out of the water. Her killer is discovered, but makes this case even more disturbing. Two horrific crimes set in the beautiful backdrop of Suffolk is today's episode of Frightful Fridays. We hope you enjoy the show. The Thrandleston Murder of Mary Baker, 1851. Our first Suffolk story takes place in the small village of Thrandleston in July 1851. It is the annual fair on the village green of Thrandleston. Of the hundreds attending are John Mickleberg, property owner, Mary Baker, milkmaid and servant to John Mickleberg, John Bootman, Mary Baker's sweetheart, Clara French, Mary Baker's sister, and John French, Mary Baker's brother-in-law. All seem to ha be having a jolly time. Some wine and brandy and water is bought, and much chatting at what appears to be a convivial meet-up at the fair. On the outskirts of the village green is a beer house, where Mary and her sweetheart repair to, having had some drinks with the others and seen some of the stalls at the fair. It is here that the murder of Mary Baker takes place in plain view of the forty or so people within the beer house. From the Suffolk Chronicle, the 9th of August, 1851, Atrocious Murder at Thrandleston. A young woman named Mary Baker has been stabbed by one John Mickleberg at Thrandleston Fair on the evening of Thursday the 31st of July, 1851. The unfortunate woman died from the effects of the wound on Friday afternoon, and the charge against Mittelberg, who was arrested soon after the occurrence, and remanded for the, from the next morning to Ipswich Jail to await the result, consequently assumed the most serious complexion. Mickleberg, it appears, is a small farmer residing on the green at Thrandleston, a village between three or four miles from I. His occupation consists of about 40 acres of land, of which about two-thirds are his own property, and he possesses, besides certain rights of common land, and is the owner of various cottages in Thrandleston and shelf hanger Norfolk, from whence he originally came. He is upwards of forty years of age, is married, and has a family of three daughters. The victim of this brutality is a younger woman named Mary Baker, the daughter of a respectable labouring man at Shelfhanger. She was about twenty-one years of age, and at the time of the murder was, for the second time, in the prisoner's service, her present period of servitude having commenced at Michaelmas, 1850. She is described as a young person of considerable personal attraction, and it is rumoured in the neighbourhood that Mickleberg was much attracted to her. Indeed, he has not scrupled to boast of an intimacy with her of a positively immoral character. It is only an act of justice to her, the unfortunate deceased Mary Baker, to state that she has denied to her friends the existence of any grounds for his boast. In Thrandleston, a very large stock and pleasure fair is usually held on the green annually. On the last day of July and the first day of August, it is 
usually attended by numbers of the peasantry of the district for miles around. On the present occasion, it commenced on Thursday week, and it is currently reported that Mary Baker, having obtained permission from her mistress to attend the fair, announced her attention to Mickleburg of going there with his sweetheart. If you do, exclaimed the fellow with an oath, you shall not sleep tonight. Heedless of this threat, the girl went in the afternoon accompanied by a young man named William Bootman, a bricklayer living in the parish of Thrandleston. Mickleburg also went to the fair and in the early part of the evening was seen in a booth sitting beside Bootman and Baker. Singularly enough, he appeared there on friendly terms with both and actually treated them to wine and brandy and water. Among the parties in the booth at the time were Clara French, the sister of the deceased, and her husband, John French. There is no evidence forthcoming to show that anything passed to arouse Mittelberg's anger, but we believe he has himself stated that the girl made a gesture with her hand indicative of her preference to Bootman. Between seven and eight o'clock, the deceased Mary Baker and Bootman left the booth and repaired to a cottage close against the railway bridge about a hundred yards distant from the green, kept by Charles Barrett and opened as a beer house during fair time. The prisoner, with John French and his wife, shortly afterwards left the booth and walked towards the outskirts of the green. Mickleburg, a man of unbridled temper from all accounts, partly excited by drink and partly maddened by the indifference of the girl towards him, seems at this moment to have determined upon her destruction. Calling Clara French aside, he declared he would be revenged without specifying the object of his vengeance, and, asking her to tell her sister to be home at nine instead of 9.30, and he would meet her in the meadow. Parting from John French and his wife, there seems little doubt that he proceeded straight to the stall of William Sayer, a hawker, and purchased a spring-back knife with a stiletto blade, four and a half inches in length, from which he gave two shillings. With this weapon in his possession, he followed his intended victim to Barrett's house near the railway bridge, resolving to put his diabolical purpose into immediate execution. The murder. The prisoner walked across the room with a knife in his hand towards where Mary Baker was sitting. Upon seeing him, she said, Ah, master, here I am. He made some reply and then passed through into the back house and was absent about a minute. No one but the deceased seems to have seen him return, but a sudden heart-rending shriek from her, I'm dead! I'm dead! silenced the noise and directed the attention of everyone present to the spot. The prisoner, Mittelberg, was then seen drawing back from the girl, holding the knife before him. She herself was not aware he had stabbed her until she felt the wound which it seemed be to be accompanied with a brutish exclamation, Ah, you have it now. John French, who was sitting near, instantly seized him by the arms and held him from behind, whilst the company shouted to take the knife from him. Using a filthy expression in allusion to his alleged connection with the deceased, he added, But if she will go with Dicky, I must give her cold steel. Mary Baker's death. In the meantime, a messenger had been dispatched for medical assistance, and then, in the course of an hour or so, Mr. W. Miller, surgeon of I, was in attendance. At his directions, the young woman was undressed and placed in bed. The knife was found to have penetrated through her shawl dress stays and underclothing and entered the body between the eighth and the ninth ribs on the left side of the chest, leaving an incision about a half an inch in length. 
The poor creature suffered the most acute agony, and throughout the night gave utterances to her sufferings in the most pitiful of terms. Mr. Miller remained with her some time, and saw her again on the following morning, rendering all the assistance his skill could suggest. The poor creature gradually sank and expired between four and five in the afternoon. It was found upon a post-mortem examination being made that the knife had penetrated the body to the depth of between four and five inches, passing through the diaphragm and spleen. That Mittelberg had, with forethought, gone to purchase a knife at one of the fair stalls, then followed Mary Baker to the beer house on the outskirts of the green, is beyond question. What everyone wanted to know was, why? The answer seems to have come directly from Mittelberg himself. From the Suffolk Chronicle, the 27th of March, 1852. Murder at Thrandleston. Whilst I had hold of Mickleberg, I said, Mickleberg, whatever do you mean by what you've done? He said, I meant to do it. I went and bought the knife on purpose. He said to the policeman, you may take me and do what you like with me. I have done what I intended to do, and I hope to have done it effectively. He said, I wish my arm had been a little stronger, and I would have given her four more inches of it. I cautioned him that anything he said could be used in evidence. He then said, I have done what I intended to do. He continued, I have always done what I liked with her, ever since she has been living at mine. At the police station, he said, I went to a stall in the fair and purchased the knife. I gave two shillings for it. When I went into Charles Barrett's, Mary Baker was sitting there. She said, Ha, master, here I am. I said, Ha, more, you shan't be long before you, you have this piece of steel. I afterwards went into the back house and opened the knife, and when it was opened, it was like a dagger. If she gets well and doesn't come to my proposals, I have the best brace of pistols the world can produce. He then stated, on Wednesday my wife went to Dis, and Mary Baker slept with me that night. When he said he went into the back house, and that the knife looked like a dagger, he added, I hope she will die. On the following morning his wife came to see him. He said to her, You have suspected me before, now you know all about it. If you had died a year or two ago, this would not have occurred. The motive for the murder seems to have been one of unbridled jealousy. Although Mary Baker had always told friends that there was no illicit relations between herself and Mickleberg, appearing at the fair in public with her sweetheart they had been courting for some six months, seems to have pushed Mickleberg over the edge, and, in blind jealousy, he killed her. The trial. The trial was open and shut in terms of the murder and the identity of the murderer. The real question was whether Mickleberg knew what he was doing at the time of the murder. Much evidence was produced of his history of insanity within the trial. From all accounts, he would most likely have been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, as his history described a cycle of manic fits followed by deep depression that had gone on throughout his lifetime. The judge, in his summation, stressed that the letter of the law was based on whether Mittelberg understood at the time of purchasing the knife and then following Mary Baker and his subsequent stabbing of her, whether he was aware of what he was doing and if he re realised that it was wrong. The jury took a few minutes to consider and concluded that Mittelberg was guilty. Mickleberg then asked to say a few words. What follows is a rambling speech stating that he knew his defence of insanity would not work because he was clearly sane. He goes on to say that if the jury and learned judge had known the whole truth, they would have found him innocent.
Mickelberg does not relay what the whole truth that he refers to is. The judge pronounced the death sentence. As expected, pleas for clemency are submitted to the Home Secretary and actually succeed. He is admitted to having a diseased intellect and his death sentence is commuted to life in prison. He is released with time served after 20 years after being sentenced. But John Mickelberg himself is murdered in 1888, 35 years after his killing of Mary Baker. From the Northampton Mercury, the 10th of March, 1888, tragic end of a murderer. Kenning Hall Workhouse in Suffolk, where an inmate was killed about 12 months ago, has again been the scene of a fatal quarrel. The victim in this case being a man named John Mickelberg, who was himself, 35 years ago, sentenced to death for the murder of a girl at Thrandleston Fair. Mickelberg was an inmate of the sick ward, and among the attendants was a pauper named John Ravel Burroughs. A quarrel took place between them about a week ago, and Mickelberg, who was severely beaten, died on Thursday week. The Thrandleston murder for which he was sentenced to death happened so long ago that the circumstances are almost forgotten, but they were brought to remembrance a few months back by some proceedings in the Ipswich Bankruptcy Court. At that time, it was reported that Mickelberg was obtaining an honest living, and in deference to the man's own position as well as to the feelings of the family, no public notice was taken of the old story. It appears that Mickelberg, after his sentence, was reprieved and released twenty years later on a ticket of leave. The Corton Pond Mystery, 1920 our second episode of Murderous Stories from Suffolk is the disturbing case of the death of 13-year-old Edith Elizabeth Howes. From the Daily Herald, the 1st of July, 1920, The Beckoning Hand, young girl's body found floating in a pond. Suffolk Mystery. Some schoolboys who had gone to fish on Saturday in a lonely tree-shadowed pond near Corton, a village just north of Lowestoft, were startled to see a hand protruding from the water. Seized with horror, they rushed from the scene to the neighbouring village. There they found the constable named Bickers, who, on hearing the story, hastened to the spot with the boys following timidly behind. When he reached the pond, the policeman saw that the boys had been telling the truth, and that a hand was indeed apparent above the placid and desolate waters in an attitude of ghastly beckoning. Summoning up his courage, he caught hold of the ice-cold fingers and brought to light the body of a young girl that apparently had been floating a little below the surface of the water. Body Identified Inquiries that were quickly set on foot soon resulted in the body being identified as that of Edith Elizabeth Howes, an attractive girl of 13, who had been living with her parents at 2 Factory Street in Lowestoft. It soon became evident that death was due to violence, and the report by the police surgeon stated that the girl had been outraged previously to death. At the inquest on the girl, which was opened here this afternoon, a girl named Emma Ellen Tuttle gave evidence of identification and said that she last saw Edith Howes at 9.20 on Saturday morning walking along the Corton Road with her father about one and a half miles from the scene of the tragedy. Coroner and Father the father was present at the inquest, and on the advice of the coroner, he reserved his cross-examination of the witness. The only other evidence 
was that given by the police who described the recovery of the body and the inquest was adjourned until June the 21st in order to allow the police to complete their investigation. The pond where the body was found is in a field almost opposite Corton Pleasure Gardens, which once belonged to Coleman, the Mustard King, a thickly wooded garden of great extent. The pond is almost entirely screened from observation from the main road and has steeply sloping banks. This brutal attack shocked the public and made national headlines. It was not just the murder, it was the outrage, violation itself, which added to the highly grim nature of the crime. This shock was heightened to disbelief when the girl's own father became the primary suspect. From the Yarmouth Independent, 5th of June, 1920. There was a sensational development in connection with the girl's death when on Wednesday William Howes, aged 40, her father was charged at Lowestoft Police Court with murdering his daughter. Evidence which was only formal was given by Superintendent Newson that the prisoner, when asked to account for his movements, could not do so satisfactorily. A post-mortem on the girl's body revealed the fact that she had been outraged, probably stunned and put into the water alive, the cause of death been drowning. Prisoner was seen to part from his daughter at Duke's Head Street, Lower Stoft, on the morning of the tragedy, and evidence had been obtained that he was seen near the spot on Corton Road with the girl on the morning when this affair took place. About William John Howes Howes was a decorated soldier who had served in the Boer War and had seen action in Luz and Ypres during the Great War. Howes had been blown up in Ypres and was known to suffer from trembling of his limbs, insomnia and weakness. He had been given a medical discharge on the 30th of August 1918. Investigations by police discovered some disturbing stories of the Howes household. In February 1920, 13-year-old Edith was sent on a bus to Kessingland on a Saturday night. She was found there alone and crying and returned to her family by police. Before she was found, Harris had reported her missing to the local police, although he had placed her on the bus. In hindsight, this begged the question of whether Harris had been pre-staging the scene of the murder to come. Howes had been married three times and had two daughters aged 13 and 11 whom lived with him. His third wife left him on the 7th of May 1920 and reported being afraid of him. Howes had complained that she was trying to poison him and that she had given him syphilis. Both accusations were medically proven to be untrue. The history and family background of Howes, as well as the physical and mental frailty, which was very apparent to all, played a part in the decision that was to come. From the Daily News, London, the 3rd of June, 1920. At the brief hearing at the police court today, Howes gave the appearance of a neurotic. He was trembling from head to foot, and this was explained by the fact that he had sustained shell shock at the front. He clearly declared that he was not guilty. Superintendent Newson said although the prisoner had declared to them that he parted with the girl in the main street at 10 a.m., he was seen with her near the pond at a later hour. Burial. There was a pathetic scene at the local cemetery this afternoon when the funeral of the dead girl took place. It was attended by a large number of schoolchildren. 
Howes was reminded as investigations proceeded. When asked to give his movements on the critical day, Howes stated he was at the market when the crime took place. No corroborating evidence could be found to support his statement. Instead, the police managed to collect 20 witnesses placing Howes at the scene of the crime during the murder window. His trousers were also seen to be wet when he arrived back home and there were scratches upon his face which he had no explanation of. From the Daily Herald, the 9th of July, 1920. Girl dead in pond. Verdict against father. A coroner's jury at Lowestoft today returned a verdict of willful murder against William John Howes, aged 40, fisherman, the body of whose daughter, aged 13, was recovered from a pond in Corton on May the 29th. A post-mortem examination, it was stated, showed that the girl had been violated, stunned and thrown into the pond. Howes was seen in the vicinity of the pond in the girl's company, and later it was noticed that his face was scratched and bleeding. Asked if he would like to give evidence, Howe replied, I've nothing to say except what I told Detectives White and McCraw. The coroner said the main point was that Howe's told the police that during the critical hours of 10 till 12, he was on at the market. There was no evidence of this, but there was evidence that he was in the vicinity of the pond at that time. The trial took place and Howes was found guilty. Between 20 witnesses proving his being in the vicinity of the crime during the critical hours, the clear discrepancies with his statements, his wet trousers and the scratches on his face, the finding of towels in the house containing a mixture of blood and emissions. Howes had little defence. Even with the horrific brutality imposed on his own daughter, the jury was sympathetic as Howes was plainly a broken man. From the Aberdeen Press and Journal, 28th of October 1920, Death Sentence on Fishermen. William John Howes, 42, fisherman of Lowestoft, was sentenced to death at Suffolk Assizes yesterday for the murder of his daughter, age 13. The girl was found dead in a pond with injuries to her head. She had been outraged. The jury recommended the prisoner to mercy on account of his physical and mental condition, and the judge said their recommendation would be forwarded to the proper quarter. Interestingly, in this case that would have normally topped the papers, much of the trial is not covered in the papers, we suspect, due to government influence, Howes was clearly suffering shell shock, or PTSD, from the war. Stories of soldiers suffering PTSD were downplayed in general in the press. With the conviction and the appeal for mercy from the jury, the, the case is brought before the Home Secretary, who grants a reprieve to Howes. Howes is placed in an insane asylum to stay there for as long as His Majesty's pleasure. From the Western Times, the 16th of November, 1920. Murderer reprieved. William John Howes, the lowest off fisherman who was to have been executed for the murder of his young daughter, has been reprieved with a view to his removal to an asylum. William John Howes, was sent to Broadmoor Asylum for the Criminally Insane, and he died in 1943. That concludes this episode of Wicked Wednesdays, Murderous Stories from Suffolk. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy this show, we would be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our channel. We are passionate about historical crime and do our best to present interesting cases from long ago that go beyond the usual fare. 
for our listeners and subscribers, thank you. We so very much appreciate the many supporters and subscribers who have helped us to build this channel. The News of the Times team all appreciate each of you for your help. We upload four days a week. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time spans of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Mondays are murderous where we investigate in depth a historical murder. Wednesdays are wicked where we pull together stories of a similar theme such as stories of murders by starvation. And Fridays are frightful, with stories that are grouped by geographic location, allowing us to share lesser-known grisly crime stories. From all of us at the News of the Times team, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.